On Wednesday nights, we've been going verse by verse through the New Testament book of Romans. Romans is a book about good news, but in order to understand and appreciate the good news, we must first understand and accept the bad news. Tonight, we're going to be looking at Romans chapter 3, which is the end of a three-chapter argument that the Apostle Paul has been meticulously putting together piece by piece. And the goal of these three chapters, the goal of Paul's argument, is to convince us of the truth, that we are all guilty, that we are all sinners in need of a Savior. In chapter 1, Paul proved that everybody on earth has sinned. In chapter 2, Paul proved that being Jewish doesn't automatically exempt you from God's judgment. And tonight, in chapter 3, Paul answers an objection that he knew people would have. Well, if being Jewish, if being part of God's chosen people, doesn't automatically make you safe from God's judgment, then what's the point? Is there any benefit to being Jewish at all? And so Paul picks up this objection in Romans chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage, then, has the Jew? Or what profit of circumcision? Much in every way, chiefly because to them were committed the oracles of God. Paul picks up this objection. If God is going to judge the Jewish people, then is there any benefit, or he says advantage, at all to being Jewish? And Paul's answer is yes, lots of advantages. He says much in every way. And we're going to find out more about what those ways are when we get to chapters 9 through 11. But for now, Paul gives us one main example. And he says that the Jewish people were the ones who had been given the oracles of God. This phrase, the oracles of God, means the Old Testament scriptures. And especially the promises that were contained within them. You see, God had made special promises to the Jewish people that he had not made to any other nation. God promised that he had chosen the Jewish people to be his special people and that there would be special privileges that came along with being his special people. But Paul knew that this answer that he gave to the first objection we see in this chapter would only lead to another objection in the mind of his Jewish countrymen. And here was the second objection. Oh yeah, big deal, Paul. What good are all those promises if those promises can't even protect us from God's judgment? I mean, what good is it to be God's chosen people if he might still end up sending some of us to hell? That sounds like a contradiction, Paul. I mean, isn't God breaking his promise to bless the Jewish people if he ends up punishing some of the Jewish people? Good question. Paul picks up that objection in Romans chapter 3, verse 3. For what if some did not believe? Will their unbelief make the faithfulness of God without effect? Certainly not. Indeed, let God be true, but every man a liar. God had made many promises to bless the Jewish people. Let's look at perhaps one of the most famous. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 29, Verse 11, listen to this promise that God made to the Jewish people. God said to them, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. This is a glowing promise. And yet, how do we reconcile a promise like this with the kind of things that Paul's been talking about in the book of Romans? Paul just spent two chapters arguing that God was going to pour out his wrath on everyone, including the Jewish people. Yet, God had also made these kind of promises. How do we reconcile those two things? Well, it is true. God had made promises in the Old Testament to bless the Jewish people. But God had also made promises to judge any of the Jewish people who rebelled against him. You see, God made lots of different kinds of promises in the Old Testament. And so God's judgment of those Jews who rebel against him is not an example of God failing to keep his promises, but actually an example of God 
faithfully keeping his promises. Because God had made promises not just of blessing, but also warnings of judgment. And so, God is just as much keeping his promises when he blesses Israel as he is when he judges Israel. Either way, they are both examples of God keeping his word. When God judges people for their sin, it's another demonstration of how faithful God is to all of his promises, including the promises about judgment. Paul quotes a passage from the Old Testament to prove the point that he's trying to make, to prove that God's judgment is not a sign that he's broken his word, it's a sign that he's actually kept it. Look with me at Romans chapter 3 at the end of verse 4. Paul says, as it is written, that means as it is written in the Old Testament, that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. This quotation is from Psalm 51. Psalm 51 was written by a Jewish king named David. And King David had committed some terrible sins. He had committed adultery, and then he had a man murdered to try to cover it up. And God punished him for it. He judged David for it. And so, David finally repents and confesses his sin to God. And that's what Psalm 51 is. It's King David's moving and emotional prayer of confession and repentance. And in this particular verse that Paul quotes, David is admitting to God that the punishment that he got from God was completely his own fault. David was basically saying to God, God, I, I know, you warned me this was going to happen. You warned us that you would judge us if we sinned. And so, God, I completely understand it is right for you to keep your word and judge me for the sin that I've done. In fact, God, the judgment that you have poured out on me proves that you are a God who does keep his promises. God's judgment of those Jewish people who rebelled against him is not evidence of the fact that he had broken his promise to them, but that he keeps his promises to them. And when the Jewish people were unfaithful, that provided another opportunity for God to just demonstrate how faithful he is and that he always keeps his promises. Paul knew that this answer to the previous objection would lead to yet another objection from his Jewish countrymen. And here is this objection. Well, okay, Paul, if our sin gives God a chance to demonstrate his faithfulness, then why would God judge us for that? I mean, if our broken promises show off how faithful God is to his promises, then how could it be right that he would punish us for that? That just doesn't seem fair, Paul. Well, Paul picks up this objection in Romans chapter 3, verse 5. But if our unrighteousness demonstrates the righteousness of God, what shall we say? Is God unjust who inflicts wrath? I speak as a man. Certainly not. For then, how will God judge the world? For if the truth of God has increased through my lie to his glory, why am I also still judged as a sinner? Paul here points out how ridiculous this argument really is. Let me try to explain. This is a very complicated passage. But let's imagine that there's a football team, okay? And this football team has a terrible offensive line. But they have a quarterback who's a really good runner. And so the game day finally comes. And oh, the offensive line is just stinking it up. They are just terrible. They just collapse on every play and just let the D-line just completely charge through. And so every play of the game, the quarterback is having to scramble outside of the pocket. But the failure of the offensive line gives the quarterback an opportunity to show off his running ability. In fact, this quarterback has such an amazing game and is such an amazing runner that he scores six rushing touchdowns and rushes for 500 total yards himself. Then, after the game, in the locker room, the coach sits down the entire offensive line, and he says, you guys were the worst I have ever seen. You are all fired. You're all gone. I'm done with you. But then imagine 
that the offensive linemen object to the coach's judgment. And they say, well, wait a minute, coach. I'm not sure that's fair. I mean, if we hadn't done such a bad job, the quarterback would never have been able to show off what a good runner he is. <laughs> now, we're laughing because that's a ridiculous argument, right? Well, that's the same argument that Paul was fighting against in this passage. The Jewish people were saying, well, okay, Paul, if our sin gives God a chance to show off what a good judge he is, then uh, we don't think we should get judged for our sins. But Paul answers back, he goes, you guys are not making any sense. He says, if God didn't judge you for your sins, then he wouldn't be a good judge in the first place. And so what you're saying does not add up. This objection is so ridiculous. Paul points out that it would kind of be the same as saying, let's do evil so that God can do good. In fact, Paul takes up that ridiculous objection in Romans chapter 3, verse 8. Paul says, and why not say, let us do evil that good may come, as we are slanderously reported, and as some affirm that we say, their condemnation is just. Paul is saying, this is so ridiculous. That is obviously not what I'm saying. I'm not saying we should all go around sinning to give God an opportunity to show off how faithful he is to his promises about judgment. That would be just as ridiculous as those offensive linemen intentionally planning on doing a bad job in the next game in order to give the quarterback an opportunity to show off his running ability. That doesn't make any sense. Paul says their condemnation is just. He says those people making those kind of weak arguments, they're going to get what they deserve. Anyone trying to use an argument that weak is just revealing how guilty they actually are. Now, in the next passage, Paul begins the conclusion to this three-chapter-long argument. He begins to wrap it up and bring it all together. And so in verse 9, he says, what then? What's the point? What then? Are we, the Jewish people, better than they, the Gentiles? Not at all. For we have previously charged both Jews and Greeks that they are all under sin. This phrase is the point of this very complicated three-chapter argument that the Apostle Paul has been making. This is his conclusion of this phase of the book of Romans. What is the conclusion? That everyone is guilty before God and that everyone deserves God's judgment. And this conclusion is not just Paul's conclusion alone. This is actually the conclusion of the Old Testament. Look with me in Romans chapter 3 starting in verse 10. It says, as it is written, remember that means as it is written in the Old Testament. As it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Most people think, that the way to go to heaven is by being a good person. And most people believe that they themselves are good enough to make the cut. And so if I asked the first 100 people walking down Fruitvale Avenue, if I asked the first 100 people the question, do you think that you're good enough to get to heaven? 90% would say yes. 90 out of 100 people would say, oh yeah, yes, I'm good enough to get myself to heaven. But according to this passage, 0% of us are good enough to get ourselves to heaven. What that means is that there are 8 billion people on planet Earth right now. Not a single one of us is good enough to get ourselves to heaven. Well, if this passage says that no one is good enough, then why is it that 90% of humanity somehow still thinks that they're good enough? I mean, how could that many people be wrong? How could that many people be deceived? Why is it 
that 90% of humanity thinks that going to heaven is by being a good person. Well, personally, I think there's probably multiple reasons. First of all, I think this is one of Satan's most convincing lies because it's so sneaky. It sounds so close to the truth. This doesn't sound like something Satan would say. We wouldn't expect that Satan would say, hey, be really good all the time. Keep all the rules in the Bible. Go to church every single Sunday. Be a really good person. Be so religious. And if you try hard enough, you might just make it in. But you know what? That is a trick. That is a trap because Satan knows what the Bible says, that no one will ever be good enough to make it in on their own no matter how hard they try. I think a second reason that 90% of humanity thinks that the way to go to heaven is by being a good person is because that way of thinking appeals to our sinful nature. In our prideful, wicked hearts, we want to go on believing that we're doing all right and we're all pretty good people. In our prideful, wicked hearts, we want to take the credit for our own salvation. We want to think that we earned it by our good behavior and that we are so much better than all those people out there who failed to earn it. But the first step to becoming a Christian is to humble ourselves, to admit that we aren't good enough and that we could never be good enough, to admit that we are sinners and that we have completely, absolutely, totally failed. And that's not easy to do because it goes against our prideful hearts. I think a third reason that 90% of humanity thinks that going to heaven is about being a good person is because that's exactly what all other religions teach. Every other major religion on earth says that the way to go to heaven or paradise or nirvana or wherever is to be a good person. That there's a certain amount of rules that you have to keep, a certain amount of good deeds that you have to perform. And that if you try really, really hard, and if you try your best to be a good person, then maybe you can earn your own way in. Now, the details look different depending on which religion it is, but the big idea is the same. Whether that's the five pillars in Islam, whether that's the seven sacraments in the Catholic Church, whether that's the eightfold path of enlightenment in Buddhism. And so no wonder most people think that going to heaven is about being good enough. That's what all the other religions on the earth are teaching them to believe. But that is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that no one will ever be good enough, no matter how hard we try, because we have all sinned. And therefore, all of us have fallen short of the perfection that is required to make it into heaven. Now, I use this passage right here, uh, Romans 3, 10 through 12. I use this a lot when I'm witnessing to people about Jesus. I love to use this passage to try to help people see that we've all sinned and, and we all need Jesus. And here's how I use it. I'll say to them, okay, so what I hear from you is, is you're saying that you think you're basically a good person and that you're good enough and you're going to be okay. You're going to make it in on your own. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. And then I'll say, you know, you seem like a very nice person, but may I please share with you what the Bible says? I'd like to read a passage to you. And then afterwards, I'd like to ask you a question about what the passage says. But I'm going to give you the question ahead of time to make it nice and easy. And here's the question. According to this passage, how many people are good enough to earn their own way into heaven? And I'll say, okay, let's read the passage together. And I'll show them Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 10. There is none righteous. No, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good. No, not one. And then I'll say, okay, according to this passage, how many people are good enough to earn their own way to heaven? And if they're honest and if they were paying attention, then they'll almost always admit no one. They'll say, yeah, it says no one's good enough to make it themselves. So then I'll ask this question. I'll say, okay. So just for the sake of argument, for a second, let's assume that it was correct that the way to go to heaven was by being a good person. If that was true, according to this passage, how many people would make it in? None, right? That's it. Heaven would be empty, all right? 
Then I'll say to them, I'll say, I like to, I like to tw twist the dagger a little. I will say, I'll say, so, you know, like, what's the solution? If none of us are good enough, is there any hope? I mean, is there any way for us to make it in? And then that's when we can start talking about Jesus, all right? Now, by the way, this passage about no one being good enough, it helps us with yet another common objection that people often bring up against Christianity. You probably heard this objection. You might have wondered this yourself. And the objection is this. Why does God let bad things happen to good people? Why does God let bad things happen to good people? And that's a complex question, and there's not really any easy answers. But I do think part of the answer comes from this passage, because what we see is God doesn't let any bad things happen to any good people. Because, you got it, because there are no good people according to this passage. <laughs> according to this passage, there are no good people on earth for God to let any bad things happen to. The question itself is flawed. Let's look at Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Paul goes on to say, Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped. That, meant, that means shut closed, let's say it that way. That every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. What Paul is saying is that in the Old Testament, one of the purposes of the law in the Old Testament was to shut every mouth so that all the world would become guilty before God. This is courtroom language. This is a courtroom scene. I don't know if there's anybody out there who loves those kind of courtroom law shows, but here we have a courtroom scene. In this scene, God is the judge and the whole world is on trial. And the prosecuting attorney is demolishing the defendant by leveling accusation after accusation after accusation against them. Until finally, the prosecuting attorney has made their case so completely that the defendant has nothing more to say. No defense left to give in the face of such overwhelming evidence that had been leveled against them. The trial is over. No chance for a plea bargain. No chance of acquittal, no chance of a retrial. The defendant, the world, has been found guilty on all charges. And it's time for the sentence to be carried out. It's time for the execution. Look with me at the last verse that we'll look at tonight. Romans chapter 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul says there will never be anybody who becomes justified by keeping the rules of the law. The law can't save anyone. But what the law can do is show us that we need to be saved. In other words, the rules of the Bible, the moral rules in the Bible, can't save anybody. But what they can do is show us that we need to be saved that we need a savior. Because if we're honest with ourselves, there is not a single rule in the entire Bible that any of us have perfectly kept. We have broken every single one of them one way or another. Now, most of the Jewish people in Paul's day thought that the way you get to heaven is by keeping the commandments. You know, many people today still think the same thing. But this verse says that no one will ever get to heaven by keeping the commandments of the Bible. That way of getting to heaven simply doesn't work. Why not? Because none of us have kept the commandments. Well, then what good are the commandments? Paul says, through the law, we become aware of our sin. You see, the commandments don't make us clean. They show us that we are dirty. The law, the commandments, the rules of the Bible... They're like a mirror that shows us our true self, and it's an ugly picture. They are a mirror that shows us how dirty we really are. Imagine that you're at a restaurant, and you are chowing down on a big, fat, juicy, 
quadruple cheeseburger, all right? And I actually had a quadruple cheeseburger last night. But anyways, <laughs> then you go to the bathroom and you walk by the mirror. Whoa, you notice that you've got ketchup and mustard all over your face. So what would you do? Would you start rubbing your face on the mirror to try to get yourself clean? No, of course not. You wouldn't do that because that's not the mirror's job. The mirror can't make you clean. The mirror can only show you that you're dirty. It's the sink's job to get you clean. So after you saw how dirty you are in the mirror, you would have to go to something else to get clean. You'd have to go to the sink to get clean. Did you know that it's the same thing spiritually? The rules of the Bible are like a mirror. They show us how spiritually dirty we really are. But those same rules can't make you clean. You would have to go to something else to get spiritually clean. You would have to go to the fountain to get clean. And there is only one fountain pure enough to wash away sin, the blood of Jesus Christ. You see, the law, the commandments, the rules of the Bible, are a mirror that show us how desperately we need to be washed clean in the fountain of Jesus' blood. Jesus lived a perfect, sinless life. He died on the cross to take the punishment we deserve for our sins. And on the third day, he rose back from the dead. And the Bible says anyone who will repent and believe in him can be saved, can become justified, can become righteous in God's sight. And so if you have never believed in Jesus before, then please repent and believe in him tonight so that you too can be washed clean. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we know that none of us are good, no, not one. God, we know that in our own goodness and our own righteousness, we do not stand a chance. We are a part of the whole world that has been condemned guilty before God. But God, we thank you that there is forgiveness and hope in Jesus Christ. God, we thank you that by believing in Jesus, we can be declared not guilty. We can receive your grace and be saved. Lord, I pray that, that truth would change our lives and that it would be a truth that we share with everybody we possibly can. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.